6529. Are you paging 6529? You there? I think I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Giving you the floor. Great. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed listening to our friends from Transient Labs uh, give their presentation. And I'm going to say something at the end that ties with what they were describing. But before we go there, I'd like to start again, big picture. And this is a continuation of something I first described a few weeks ago, I tweeted about. I think it's important. I think we see a lot of these terms thrown around these days, and I'm not sure everyone has them fully clear in their minds what they mean, how they interact together, why they're important, and then we'll get all the practical the end. <laughs> the thing I'd like to talk about are means and the intersubject. And if the intersubjective was one of these very nerd terms a while ago. And then you've all popularized it, but it still never really made it into the crypto sphere. And now Eigenlayer is talking about it, and it's a little bit um, kind of fits what they're doing, kind of doesn't. So I want to, let's see if we can get to a common understanding of these things. So they're actually quite important. The intersubjective is the following. You can imagine three states of understanding the world. The objective. We can agree that this rock is one kilogram. You can weigh it, I can weigh it, it exists. We all agree it's one kilogram. It's objective. The subjective is our internal feelings. I'm happy speaking to NFC today. Right. I can tell you I'm happy. You can't really independently verify it. It's internal to me. It's subjective. The intersubjective are somehow non-verifiable things we believe together. Uh, shared stories, shared myths. And they're everywhere. I think the key insight from you all is that this is how humans organize and align any large group of people, anything larger than a few hundred people, whether this means a business, a religion, a nation, a community, a university. Anytime you have large groups of people who you need them to, or you want them to, or their effectiveness is determined by how well they work together. You need to build, you need to have a common set of beliefs, a common set of alignment. And the reason is, is you can't just manage people at that scale, right? If you have five people, you don't have to worry about this. You can just tell them what to do, or you can all agree together what to do. But if you want a bunch of people to work together on behalf of the great nation of Portugal, well, they have to believe in the great nation of Portugal. And how does that happen? Probably more or less from the day they're born, society works to align Portuguese children, just like it does Italian children, American children, Indian children, Japanese children, to take the simple one, the one you can't miss, to believe in and be proud of their country. Here's the flag, here's the national anthem, here's our history, here's our great accomplishments. Look at the statue of this great Portuguese leader. Let's go to the museum. Let, look at this important work of art. Let's show respect to the head of state. There's 20 years of alignment from the time you're a child to the time you become an adult. To hopefully, this is the goal, whether it's neutral, whether Nationalism is very bad. That can exist, and this is how it works. That you're proud of your country. And if you're proud of your country, you'll do pro social things from anything like saying nice things about your country to future terrorists, right? The simple, those simple things who, in extreme cases, dying in war for your country. There's no 
Portugal the thing you will die for, objectively in the world. Someone might say it's the border, but the border is just, it's just some rocks, right? Like, there's no border, objectively. You can't weigh the border. The borders have moved. People don't die for the rocks in the border, they're dying for an idea. And so, the intersubjective is very important. It's arguably everything of importance in human society. And everything in all realms, not just politics, not just, yes, we can, Obama, or make America great, again, Trump, which apparently we're going to hear again now. Um, but Nike, or Louis Vuitton, or Oxford University, all these things generate a certain group feeling that leads to actions and power, political power, economic power, cash flows from selling products are all downstream from this. And you, you know, say, are you talking about brands? I mean, kind of brands are a form of it, but not all of it. Are you talking about shared ideas? Kind of, but not all of it. But it's there, right? It's kind of the apex object of human society. And then, say, well, right, let's talk about memes for a second. Memes are, well, they've always been with us, but as a concept, they're a new concept. As a concept named the way they are named. The word meme, it's very funny because everyone thinks that the word meme came from some internet edgelords or something. But that's not at all how it came, right? It came from Richard Dawkins, who was a professor at Oxford. And he wanted to find a word to express this idea. And the idea he wanted to express was the word gene, as an evolutionary biologist, and a Greek word, um, mimesis means Im imitation. And so he mashed them together and came up with meme. And what was the idea? And the idea was that certain cultural expressions, cultural objects, spread the way genes spread. They spread because they're evolutionarily advantaged. And they're not evolutionarily advantaged biologically. They live longer and have more children, but they're socially evolutionarily advantaged. They are in tune with the culture, in tune with people's feelings. People hear them and tell them to the next person. They are presumably something like the opposite of cringe. It's the cool thing, not the uncool thing. And at any point in time, that changes, right? Things that were cool 30 years ago were not cool now. And so this existed as a kind of an academic concept. And then the internet came along. And the internet broke down centralized distribution of information. And when you did that, when you didn't have editors and newspapers and what have you, you had a lot more mimetic transmission because all of a sudden you had the whole world competing to make the coolest image, the funniest tweet, the most compelling post on Facebook. And as in every other situation in human history, when you have, on the one hand, a few hundred or a few thousand or even a few hundred of thousand professionals in the field, and on the other hand, you have all eight billion people competing to do something, all eight billion people are better than all the editors of all the newspapers come up. And so memes got much better, they got more viral, they got more edgy, they became less corporate, less boring, less cringe, you know. And, you know, if you ask anyone today, what's a meme? Probably anyone of a certain age, you know, it's a thing on the internet. It's our frogs, it's our pepes, it's our cats, it's our old chats, whatever, right? But memes, the concept predates that, and the concept predates the word, but for sure the internet is the perfect environment. And the thing that I, I'd like you to take away, if you take away one thing, 
law. I think in practice the intersubjective is built by means. And I want to give an example. It's an easy, I'm going to give an example. It's easy for people to think about. Take U.S. elections. The intersubjective is how Obama voters in aggregate feel about Obama. No, Mr. Obama's not, he's a person. Sure, he's a person. But Obama the person and Obama the idea you have about Obama, someone who has never met him like almost all of us, probably there's some gap, right? Like there's Obama the person and Obama the idea, the intersubjective idea. And Donald Trump, there's Donald Trump the person and Donald Trump the intersubjective idea. There's probably a significant gap between the person and the idea. So when someone says, I voted Obama and I believe in Obama, or I voted Trump and I believe in Trump, they're going to say, well, of course I wasn't influenced by a meme. I believe in them because of X, Y, Z important reasons. But I don't think that that's true. Like, I don't think that is the way the social construction works. I think the memes come first, they create the feelings first, and then they build the inverse objective, and then you kind of like back and rationalize it. And it's easy to see because like when Hillary Clinton was running her campaign and would drop these 500 page documents of all her policy positions. I never met a single person who them. Maybe her positions were good, maybe her positions were bad. I don't think anyone knows because I don't think anyone read them. But yes, we can was a good meet and Obama got away. Make America great was a good meet. Trump got away. But I'm not judging the people themselves. They might be good, bad, or indifferent. What I'm judging is the process. So, my view is, Andrew Subjective is the apex object of society, right? People die for it. It's built by means. George Washington, the apple, right? The apple tree get chopped down, right? The Statue of Liberty, these things build American nationalism. And the memes have gone to the internet why you have had a bunch of battles between the centralized providers of the intersubjective, the government, the traditional media, and social media. All of these battles are about the centralized providers of the intersubjective losing some control of the intersubjective itself. And going to now, now going to the centralized providers of the intersubjective which is our collective mimetic approach on social media. And this is, I think, up until about 2020 here, that's the situation. What we've seen since then, something very interesting, is that NFTs give economic rails, they give economic power to internet means. And when I say internet memes, I don't want to make that, I don't just mean Pepe's, right? Like, you know, some of them are going to be Pepe's, and some of them might be graphic art, like 6539 makes, and I see it's up on the screen. But it's more general. It is anything that is evolutionarily fit for today's internet environment, which could be all types of things. And what's super, super interesting, what is the very new thing, is that the decentralized providers of means, the decentralized providers of the interest objective, suddenly have a way to wrap economics around them. And this is really new. Um, this is something that the centralized providers always have. The New York Times had an economic model, Nike has an economic model, the federal government has an economic model. But the decentralized providers of interest objective did not. And now they do, now we do. And this is the very, very beginning. When I look at NFTs, I think we're on year two or three or four practice of 30. There's no doubt this is going to evolve into something vastly larger than what it is today. 
I think it will compete for meaning. And that's where you need to start. In the end, that's more important than any technical issue competing for meaning. But because we have this open, decentralized database called Ethereum, Bitcoin, or Solana, you can actually wrap you can actually wrap the meaning in programmability in databases. This is what Transit was talking about. And so I spend no time worrying that oh people say mean things about cartoon monkeys or whatever. None of that, none of that matters. This is this is a societal level shift. You are at the very beginning of it. As I've told many people before, I was around in early Bitcoin days. This has the same feeling to me. And so be patient, do interesting things, focus on meaning, and the rest will come naturally. Have a great conference, everyone. And as always, thank you for having me.